Hello, my name is David Broussard and welcome to Catapult TV. Today we're talking about identity and access management with Joe Custer. Joe, today we're going to talk about how do we simplify access to cloud and on-premise apps. And what we really want to do is build in SSO if we can. And, and you tell me that the, the, the technology for this is Azure App Proxy, is that right? Sure. So there's a couple different ways that we can approach it, but basically what we have is a very rich availability of being able to present cloud applications into, you know, we've got a, a, a very large gallery mm -hmm. of pre-made applications that are just a couple clicks and you're fully integrated. Plus it so, still supports a lot of the other standards. OAuth, SAML, and so forth. So even so, if so, it's something else we're talking about here, uh, you know, like Salesforce, right? Yeah, would be one. Uh, Concur, right? Yeah. Uh, I see Facebook up there. I'm assuming Twitter as well. You've got Evernote, Box, Yammer, Skype, all kinds of things that people can use, and they use all the time in the cloud, right? Absolutely. So, and they use it for work. And that's the big deal is, you know, in some cases they're using shared passwords. In some cases, somebody like purchasing might have a hundred different accounts and they're just reusing the same account they're using for other Active Directory. So it, it helps us to be able to do single sign-on with them to help secure the entire environment to know that that user is less likely to be compromised. Right, now the other side of this, of this equation is that we've still got legacy applications that are running on-premise and sometimes they can't be moved out to the cloud. And so I, we've had, I've had customers in the past who've had InfoPath forms built into their SharePoint um, uh, uh, environment and they can't move that out to the cloud because of the, the loss of fidelity or SSRS reports or maybe they've got SAP or PeopleSoft running on premise. Absolutely. So in those cases where we have those on-premises applications, everybody says, well, I need VPN access. Well, mm -hmm. that'll get you access, but it's also a heavier weight approach. Mm -hmm. It does, you know, it's, if I have an iPad or uh, trying to access it from my mobile device, that's a pretty big burden to put a VPN on a device like that and support it. Can't. Exactly. So it's not even compatible much of the time. Mm -hmm. So if we have things like SharePoint or anything that's basically displayable inside of a web browser, we're able to use Azure Application Proxy as a web proxy solution. But where it's unique is that it doesn't need to be in a DMZ. It doesn't need to be externally exposed. Hmm. It uses Azure as a connector point. So we're able to do very clever things such as take your, your cloud applications and your on-premises applications and add them directly into Office 365 so that the user experience is, I hit the, the menu in the upper left-hand corner, I see all of my apps regardless of where they live. So I have a single click to AWS or the company Facebook management account or LinkedIn or being able to switch from SharePoint Online to maybe I've got some SharePoint sites that never made the move. So I can click right there and be immediately logged in. No turning on VPNs, no stopping to load different clients or switching to remote desktop or any sort of cumbersome process. This works in any type of a modern browser. So it's not even restricted to specific classifications of devices. Now, I also get my security controls at the same time. All right, so, so let me get this straight. You're telling me that you can set it up to where I can click the app, the Waffle app launcher and I can get to Amazon Web Services or WordPress, which are out in the cloud, and, or I can get to an on-premise SharePoint instance without having to fire off a VPN and I'm all using the same normal account that I normally use. I got to see this. All right. So let's go ahead and hop over to my Office 365 instance. Uh, instance and if you've never used it here's the secure score uh, so let me hop up to the menu okay. and you'll actually see I've got AWS loaded I've got some SharePoint record center and so forth so let me go ahead and hop over so I'll start with the cloud application first and okay. so with this all we have to do is do an Azure Active Directory single sign-on app mm -hmm. and even you know the free version includes you know along with your office 365 includes up to 10 of these apps as part of that license. Okay. If you want to go above it or use the app proxy, there's some additional pieces out of Azure Active Directory Premium. But again, it's all part of the secure productive enterprise. Okay. So here I've been able to do a single click and I am logged in immediately as my AWS administrator. It was smart enough to figure out what role I had within the organization and do a federated login. So if I disable that Active Directory account on premises, 
that's going to immediately replicate up and disable my AWS access. Hmm. So, in addition, I might have other applications such as uh, being able to use WordPress or Facebook. And in, in many organizations, Facebook is a shared account. You know, your marketing team may have a, a one account they're using across the entire organization. Right. Well, if any one of those users decides to change the password and go rogue, you've immediately cut off any of the access. So you now have a rogue employee and your ability of mitigating any of that is gone. And, and we've seen that happen to organizations in the, pr in, in, in the press a number of times. Absolutely. Okay. So what this does is by single sign-on, we're able to regain control. The user just logs in single sign-on, but the advantage is, is that they never know the actual account that's being vaulted on their behalf. Oh, okay. So they're never able to change the password and go rogue. We can disable their Active Directory, it immediately shuts down their access, but they were never able to change it or do anything outside of the bounds of what they're allowed to. And so they never actually know what the password is, and we can change that on a schedule behind the scenes to make it harder for somebody outside the organization to hack it or something like that. Absolutely. So in many cases, we can even set it up to do an automatic rollover in complexity. Mm -hmm. So in the, the case of something like Twitter, that's a pretty regular request is being able to, we need to recycle that password fairly frequently to something random. Mm -hmm. Well, this lets it happen behind the scenes and still allows all of your users to log in seamlessly. So in that situation, we could have Twitter, the Twitter password being changed on a regular basis to reduce the hacking uh, exposure to us, right? But my 10 or 15 people internally, they never even know. They don't know what the account is, and they don't know what the, what the password is to get into it. More importantly, they're using their normal network credentials to get that to get in, right? And let's go ahead and take that same scenario and say, well, you could have enabled multi-factor authentication in Twitter, but not every application even supports that. Mm -hmm. But how would you handle a shared password and multi-factor at the same time where everybody's got a different device. Yeah. So that. in that type of scenario, we're able to leverage Azure Active Directory's single sign-on and multi-factor administration to be able to simplify access to that. So if I share a vaulted password with you, I can still say you need to multi-factor, but with your own device on your own credentials, and even if I'm using the same account myself, I'll have to use my devices. So if I turn that on, then it's so multi-factor authentication. Does that mean that everywhere I log in, I'm having to do multi-factor authentication then? Absolutely not. So okay. we get to control that. We can okay. do it per service and per location. Hmm. So we can even say on-premises, I'm you know, you had to badge to get into the building. So I'm going to consider that a factor. Okay. So now I can say it's something you you know mm -hmm. and access to the building. That's that's a okay. reasonable uh, level of hoop to jump through if we want to go that route. But we can say, okay, I'm going to say you're just automatically logged in without MFA. But if you're coming in from off-site, I can do, go ahead and have you prompt. Hmm. Now, in addition, I can do things like conditional access. So if I'm doing conditional access, I can say, let's say you're a concur administrator. Expenses, mm -hmm. tracking, travel, things like that. And if you're an administrator, you could approve a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, in an instance like that, I might go the route of saying, you know what, I want you to only log in to administer this from a known trusted device. And if that's the case, then I can use conditional access to say your domain join PC or a managed device with Intune. Hmm. All right, so, so you showed me AWS. Can you, can you show me a non-premise SharePoint connection? Absolutely. So, here I've got on the menu, I've got my SharePoint Record Center. Okay. And that is one of the, you know, my Record Center didn't make it up to the move as part of my sure. 365 sure. adoption. So, and just to be clear, I'm connected currently in a hotspot here in Austin, mm -hmm. and my home lab is actually up in Denver. Okay. No firewalls exceptions for this. It's okay. only uh, outbound requests from my okay. server. So at this point, it should take just a moment to load but this is creating a single sign-on connection to SharePoint for me, and now I'm in, and I have created a connection oh, with, okay. no, with no VPN, with no requirements of putting it on the web or putting it in a DMZ or anything like that. Wow. And so at this point, you've connected, that's a publicly accessible URL, right, like facebook.com or wordpress.com. If somebody hits that, they're going to be prompted for their network credentials, 
right? Mm -hmm. The same ones they always use. You can even turn on multi-factor authentication and make them because they're coming in from the outside world or uh, off their mobile device or something like that. Uh, but they're able to use this just like they were on their home, on inside the firewall on their home network. Absolutely. So we can control uh, their access to say, you know what? It, it, the first thing you see as soon as you try, if you tried to bookmark this page and mm -hmm. tried to pull it up, boom, it's going to prompt you for Azure Active Directory. Hmm. So it's going to go through that process if you're on a device that you're not already known. Hmm. But if you're on a device that is known, it's going to know who you are and automatically be able to log you in. So if you're using things like Azure AD Connect's desktop SSO or ADFS, you'll be automatically logged in. Hmm. And, and so you said this will work with SharePoint, obviously we're seeing here, but SSRS as well. Absolutely. So uh, a lot of the on-premises web applications are supported through this. So we're able to do things like Kerberos constrained delegation or building our own SAML connections. There's a lot of different ways of being able to approach it. But if it's standards-based, there's a very good chance we'll be able to integrate single sign-on. But even in the absolute worst case of something else, we're still able to present access. And even if you didn't have a true single sign-on, you'd still have remote access without a VPN. Now that is absolutely fascinating, Joe. So, so how does this all work from an architectural standpoint? If I'm thinking about this, in the past, what I've always done is I've, I've used to use TMG and UAG, and I would take SharePoint sites or or other things like that, and I would expose them. And that TMG server lived in the in the uh, DMZ and had a NIC in the DMZ and a NIC inside, and that's how I made all those connections. So, what does this look like in Azure? First, I'd say get with the times. <laughs> well, TMG, you can't even buy TMG anymore, I know. But. Exactly. So the newer way of doing the similar version of what you're describing with TMG would be a web application proxy, so okay. WAP on server 2012. However, we don't even need to go through those hoops anymore. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at our architecture here. It's very, very simplistic. And just to lay this out, so we've got Azure up at the top. We've got our devices on the left. And we have an application server that is behind your firewall inside your corporate network. Okay. Now, you'll notice it's not in the DMZ. There is not a publicly exposed IP address. It maintains an outbound persistent connection to Azure, pulling to see if there's any approved requests. An approved request is very key there because if I'm on a iPad or an Android or an iPhone or any right. modern browser and I'm making a request, I get to do conditional access checks, multi-factor authentication checks, risk-based policy control so that if I'm coming in behind a Tor network, I'm blocked. Mm. Things like being able to say, oh, I detected that your accounts were hacked, so I've automatically blocked you. Hmm. Things like, so I've gone through all my security controls. And, and, if, and if somebody is using a non-modern browser, we can also block them at that point in time, right? Absolutely. Okay. So then we're able to say we've got a trusted experience, so now I'm able to pull in that request. And again, it basically creates an SSL VPN on the fly. So it's been able to pull that in, and that's not using Azure Site-to-Site -site VPN or Point-to-Site VPN or anything like that. This is its own thing. So the Azure Application Proxy setup is a 4-meg download and a 4-click install. So, if you want high availability... Uh, even TMG wasn't that easy. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't. I loved TMG. It was nice and simple, but it wasn't that easy. I think you're the only one who thinks that was simple. But, <laughs> but if you want high availability, download a second one. They automatically will fail over. It handles that disaster recovery and high, higher availability standards automatically as part of the service. So, that's okay. the value of having Azure as the connector point. And that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. And so this, and it's through, and so this right here, I that that URL I get up on the top, that's obviously not the URL of the actual uh, resource internally, right? That that could be a dot local domain or something like that that's non-routable, and so nobody could ever is still not getting to that. But when they're when they're sitting at their desk, they go and click that, and what? So what happens if I'm inside the network and I click that same app launcher? Is it connecting me through the VP through the, the Azure proxy, or is it connecting me directly at that? So you get, to, you get to decide what your experience okay. looks like. So you could have an internal ver uh, split brain DNS approach. Sure. So you could have the internal DNS route directly to it. However, it, one of the advantages of going up through that tunnel is that we get to add all of the Azure security control. So we get to decide what's appropriate. Okay. So we could say email.contoso.com 
internally we route it directly via DNS and externally we route it through Azure Application Proxy. Okay. Hmm. All right. And so the other thing you mentioned is that I have that ability to do conditional control access. So you said if I've recognized that this account has already been hacked, for example, uh, at that point in time, I could turn off that external access entirely and force, it, force them only to do their access if they were inside the network and thus then they'd tell them to go ahead and reset their password because something has happened to them. Yes, and that's part of the Azure Active Directory identity protection stack. Okay. So out of the identity protection stack, we can automatically look at various signals to be able to determine that an account has been uh, breached or hacked. Uh, it's part of a data dump or impossible travel scenarios. A lot of different signals that Microsoft is able to gather. And we're able to use that to either automatically remediate it, so we can automatically kick off a reset or a block policy, mm -hmm. because if it has gone through a multi-factor prompt or something like that, we know the account has been fully breached. Right. So we're still able to block the access, even in the account that somebody has the stolen password and an iPhone and all of these other different things from the user. Okay. And then the other thing that you mentioned was that ability if, if a, a, an employee separates, right, the minute that they separate and I disable their internal um, AD um, account, they no longer then have access to all of those cloud accounts at that point in time. Absolutely. So that way you don't have to worry about employees going rogue with the company Twitter account, which I think we've all heard about and in some cases seen mm -hmm. and yeah. unpleasant <laughs> scenarios can true, happen. True, true. Okay. Well, Joe, thank you very much. That's, that's actually a fascinating thing and I'll tell you, I'll admit, I, I used to love TMG and UAG, but this is uh, this is a really cool way to do it and, and to allow people to get access to things without actually having to go through a VPN. That That's pretty amazing. And to be able to force, force SSO, or actually to allow SSO so that I'm not having to remember 17 passwords to 17 different systems, I think that's amazing. Thank you very much. And hey, come back and watch us again on Catapult TV.